<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm your host, the Supreme Litigant, and I'd like to welcome everybody back to Smart Loke TV. Before I begin, y'all already know the routine. If you haven't already, please go ahead and hit that like and that subscription button and turn that notification bell on. Uh, and I'll give y'all a second to do that. What happened here? Okay, um, let's see, I'm not sure what happened here. Give me a second, y'all. I'm going to pause this and see if I can get this fixed right quick. Okay, y'all, sorry about that. I do want to apologize about that. <clears throat> this um, this case is, in, is extremely long, so what I'm going to do is there's going to be a series of these videos. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole entire case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the case before the video starts, and I'm going to highlight what I think uh, is relevant and that needs to be said in each video. However, if you would like to go and read the case yourself, which I strongly advise you to do, then uh, you, you can do that. Um, I'll give you all the case citation um, uh, uh, at the end of this video. So uh, this is Miranda versus Arizona. This was decided uh, in 1966. Uh, this is a very interesting case. Of course, if you don't know, this case is where the Miranda rights comes from, where it says you have a right to remain silent. Silent, anything you can, anything you say can and will be used against you. Blah, 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 get it. Y'all get where I'm going with this. So that's what this case is about. Uh, I'm going to title this video, Do Not Talk to Police. Uh, this case is going to explain to you why you should not talk to the police. So you need to pay attention. Uh, why is it doing? It's probably doing that because I'm recording. So let's go like that. Okay, here, right here. Sorry, it's shaking like this. It's probably doing that because it's, it's recording. But anyway... Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice Warren delivered the opinion of the court. Notice it says an opinion and not a fact. The cases before us are, <clears throat> raise questions which go to the roots of our concepts of American criminal jurisprudence. The restraints society must observe consistent with the federal constitution and prosecuting individuals for crime. More specifically, we deal with the admissibility of statements obtained from an individual who is subjected to custodial police interrogation and the necessity for procedures which assure for procedures which assure that the individual is accorded his privilege under the Fifth Amendment to the Constitution uh, not to be compelled to incriminate himself. One second, y'all be right back. All right, y'all, I'm back. Sorry about that. <clears throat> We dealt with certain phases of this problem recently in es Escobedo, I'm guessing that's what that says, versus Illinois in 1964. There, uh, as in the four cases before us, law enforcement officials took the defendant into custody and interrogated him in a police station for the purpose of obtaining a, a confession. The police did not effectively advise him of his right to remain silent or of his right to consult with his attorney. Rather, they confronted him with an alleged accomplice who accused him of having perpetrated the murder. When the defendant denied the accusation and said, I didn't shoot Manuel, uh, Manuel, I'm sorry, you did it. They handcuffed him and took him to an interrogation room. There, while handcuffed and standing, he was questioned for four hours until he confessed. So they made him confess. They just tired him out. During this interrogation, the police denied his request to speak to his attorney, and they prevented him. And they prevented his retained attorney. Uh, give me one second. Where are we at? Um, rather than confront him, I think we're right here. Where are we at? Here we go, right here. Sorry about that, y'all. And they prevented his retained attorney, who had come to the police station, from consulting with him. At his trial, the state, over his objection, introduced a confession against him. Note that they're talking about the state. 
Anyway, we held that the statements thus made were constitutionally inadmissible. Guess I'm going to have to start doing it like that. I don't know why it's doing that. This case has been the subject of judicial interpretation and spirited legal debate since it was decided two years ago. Both state and federal courts, in assessing its implications, have arrived at varying conclusions. See, they're confused. They don't know. They don't really know what to do. There's, there's conflicting uh, conclusions. <clears throat> uh, a wealth of scholarly material has been written, tracing its ramifications and underpinnings. Uh, let me see. Let me go back up here. It says, police and, prosecu- police and prosecutor have speculated on its range and desirability. Rebranded certiorari in these cases. In order further to explore some facets of the problems thus exposed of applying the privilege against self-incrimination uh, to in-custody interrogation and to give, let's go down, to give concrete constitutional guidelines for law enforcement agencies and courts to follow. We start here as we did in uh, Escubido, Escubido, with the premise that our holding is not an innovation in our jurisprudence but is an application of principles long recognized and applied in other settings. We have undertaken a thorough re-examination of the Escubido decision and principles it announced, and we reaffirm it. I strongly advise y'all to watch this. Y'all need to watch this video all the way through because they're going to they're going to tell you the tactics, the uh, the psychology that these police officers use to. Um, to uh to get a uh, a confession out of people, even uh people who are actually innocent, they use psychology. Sorry, I had to get me some some water. Uh, let's go down. That case was that case was but an uh, explication of basic rights that are enshrined in our constitution that. No person shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself and that the accused shall have the assistance of counsel. Rights which were put in jeopardy in that case through official overbearing. These precious rights were fixed in our Constitution only after centuries of persecution and struggle. Uh, And in the words of Chief Justice Marshall, they were secured for ages to come and designed to approach immortality as nearly as human institutions can approach it. Over 70 years ago, our predecessors on this court eloquently stated the maxim, which is looks like some sort of Latin, uh, had its origin in a protest against the, inqui- the inquis- inquis- <clears throat> inquisitorial and manifestly unjust methods of interrogating accused persons, which have long obtained in the continental system and until the expulsion of of stewards from the British throne in 1688 and the erection of additional barriers for the protection of the people against the exercise of arbitrary power were not uncommon even in England. While the admissions or confessions of the prisoner were voluntarily and freely made, have always ranked high in the scale of incriminating evidence, if an accused person be asked to explain his apparent connection with the crime under investigation, the ease with which the, um, the questions put to him may assume an inquisitorial character. The, t- the temptation to press the witness unduly to browbeat him if he be timid or reluctant, to push him into a corner and to entrap him into fatal contradictions, which is so painfully evident in many of the earlier state trials, notably in those of Sir Nicholas, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, and Udall and the, what is that, the Puritan minister, made the system so odious, or so odious, uh, as to give rise to the demand for this total abol- uh, abolition. The change in the English criminal procedure in that particular scene, in that particular, in that particular, seems to be founded upon a statute. I'm sorry, seems to be founded upon no statute and no judicial opinion, but upon a general and silent acquiescence of the courts in a popular demand. 
but however adopted, it has become firmly embedded in English as well as in the American jurisprudence. So deeply did it inquisit of the ancient system impress themselves upon the minds of the American colonists that the states with one accord made a denial of the right to question an accused person a part of their fundamental law. So that a maxim, which is uh, which in England was a mere rule of evidence, became cloth in this country with the impregnability of a constitutional enactment. One second, y'all. Let's see. I'm going to pause the video and let me go to the second part. All right. This was the spirit in which we, dele in which we delineated uh, in meaningful language, the manner in which the constitutional rights of the individual could be enforced against overzealous policing, uh, police practice. It was necessary in, Escob in uh, Escobedo, as here, to ensure uh, that was, let me see, to ensure that what was proclaimed in the Constitution had not become but a form of words in the hands of government officials, as it is in this spirit consistent with our role as judges that we adhere to the principles of Escobedo today. Uh, let's see. Uh, our holding will be spelled out with some specificity uh, in the pages which follow, but briefly stated, it is this. The prosecution may not use statements, whether exculpatory or inculpatory, stemming, stemming from custodial uh, interrogation of the defendant unless it demonstrates the use of procedural safeguards effective to secure the privilege against self-incrimination. Let's see. By custodial interrogation, we mean questioning initiated by law enforcement officers after a person has been taken into custody or otherwise deprived of his freedom of action in any significant way. As for the procedural safeguards to be employed unless unless other fully effective means are devised uh, to inform accused to inform accused persons of their right of, of their right of silence and to assure a continuous opportunity to exercise it the following measures are required prior to any questioning the person must be warned that he has a right to remain silent that any statement he let me see that any statement he does not make wait a minute well, I'm so dyslexic, y'all. I'm sorry <laughs> that any statement he does make may be used as evidence against him and that he has a right to be present to the presence of an attorney, uh, either retained or appointed. The defendant may waive effectuation of these rights, provided the waiver is made voluntarily, knowingly and intelligently. If, however, he indicates in any manner at any stage of the process that he wishes to consult with an attorney before speaking, there can be no questioning. Likewise, if the individual is alone and indicates in any manner that he does not wish to be interrogated, the police may not question him. The mere fact that he may have answered some questions or volunteered some statements on his own does not deprive him of his right to refrain from answering any further questions inquiries until he has consulted with an attorney and thereafter consents to be questioned. The constitutional issue we decide in each of these cases is the admissibility of statements obtained from a defendant questioned while in custody or otherwise deprived of his freedom of freedom of action in any significant way. In each, the defendant was questioned by police officers, detectives, or a prosecuting attorney in a room in which he was cut off from the outside world. In none of these cases was the defendant given a full and effective warning of his rights at the outset of the interrogation process. In all the cases, the questioning elicited oral admissions, and in three of these, uh, and in three of them, signed statements as well, which were admitted at their trials. They all thus share salient features uh, in communicado interrogation of individuals in a police-dominated society, resulting in self-incriminating statements without full warnings of constitutional rights. An understanding of the nature and the setting of this in-custody interrogation is essential to our decisions today. This is where they're going to start talking about the psychology 
The difficulty in the picketing, what transpires at such interrogations stems from the fact that in this country, they have largely taken place in uh, incommunicado. So I'm guessing that's sort of uh, some sort of Spanish word, something like that. From extensive, uh, from extensive factual studies undertaken in the early 1930s, including the famous uh, Wickersham report to Congress by a presidential commission, it is clear that police violence and the third degree flourished at that time. In a series of cases decided by this court, long after these studies, the police resorted to physical brutality beating, hanging, whipping, uh, whipping, and to sustained and protracted questioning in incommunicado in order to extort confessions. This is, that's crazy. The Commission on Civil Rights in 1961 found much evidence to indicate that some policemen still resort to physical force to obtain confessions. 1961, uh, the use of physical brutality and violence is not unfortunately regulated uh, I'm sorry, relegated to the past or to any part of the country. Only recently in Kings County, New York, the police brutally beat, kicked, and placed lighted cigarette butts on the back of a potential witness under interrogation for the purpose of securing a statement incriminating a third party. So this, okay, this is the case right here, what, they, what they're talking about right there. That's crazy. Uh, I'm going to read the highlighted part right here. It is significant that instances of the third degree treatment of prisoners almost invariably took place during the period between arrest and preliminary examination. Let's see. Uh, in addition, see people versus what, what is this? This is um, looks like an Illinois. Yeah. Uh, defendants suffering from broken bones multiple bruises and injuries sufficiently serious to require eight months medical treatment after being manhandled by five policemen. Um, there's something else down here. I'm going to read that too. I'm going to read, I'm going to finish reading that footnote and then I'm going to come, I'm going to come back up. Po uh, police doctor told accused who was, let's go down. Uh, who was strapped to a chair completely nude that he proposed to take hair and skin scrapings from anything that looked like blood or sperm in vi uh, from various parts of his body. That's crazy. Defendant held in custody over two months, deprived of food for 15 hours, forced to submit to a lie detector test uh, when he wanted to go to the toilet. Defendant questioned uh, incessantly over, over, an evening time, over an evening's time made to lie on cold board what was it made to lie on cold board and to answer questions whenever it appeared he was getting sleeping? This is some sort of um, torture or something like that. It seems like it's some sort of torture. Is that it? Okay, let's go back down here, y'all. Sorry. The examples given above are undoubtedly the exception now, but they are sufficiently widespread. To the uh, to be the uh, to be the object of concern, unless a proper limitation upon custodial interrogation is achieved, such as these decisions uh, will advance. There can be no assurance that practices of this nature will be will be eradicated in the foreseeable future. The conclusion of the Wickersham report made over thirty years ago is still pertinent. To the contention that the third degree is necessary to get the facts, the reporters aptly rely, uh, I'm sorry, aptly reply in the language of the present Lord Chancellor of England. So this is a court of equity. That's why they see chancellor. In, chan in courts of equity, they call them chancellors. So this is in a, in a, uh, in a court of equity. Let's see. Let's get that back. Anyway, come on, there we go. Sorry about that, y'all. Why is it doing that? I want to make sure I get this. Uh, let's see. Lord Chancellor of England, Lord Sankey. Notice they call him Lord. This is crazy. <laughs> it is not admissible to do a great wrong by doing a little wrong. I'm sorry. It is not admissible to do a great right by doing a little wrong. It is not sufficient to do just by obtaining a proper result 
by irregular or improper means. Let me read that again, y'all. I'm so dyslexic that time. I'm sorry, y'all. It is not sufficient to do justice by obtaining a proper result by irregular or improper means. Not only does the use of the third degree involve a flagrant violation of law by the by the officers of the law, but it involves also the dangers of false confessions. And it tends to make police and prosecutors less zealous in the search for objective evidence. As the New York prosecutor quoted in the report said, it is a shortcut and makes the police lazy and unenterprising. Or, as another official quoted, remarked, if you use your fists, you are not so likely to use your wits. I agree with that. We agree with the conclusion expressed in the report that the third degree brutalizes the police, hardens the prisoners against society, and lowers the esteem in which the administration of justice is held by the public. Again, we stress that the modern practice of in-custody interrogation is psychologically rather than physically oriented. As we stated before, since Chambers, uh, when was that? I don't know when that was. But anyway, this court has recognized the co that coercion can be mental as well as physical and that the blood of the accused is not the only hallmark of an unconstitutional inquisition. Interrogation still takes place in privacy. This is where they're going to start talking about more of the tactics that they use. Y'all need to pay attention to this because if you've, if you've ever been interrogated by the police, you will probably see some of these tactics that they're going to mention uh, in this case that have been used against you. You probably didn't know it. Sorry about that, y'all. Oh, where we go? Here we go, right here. Privacy results in secrecy, and this in turn results in a gap in our knowledge as to what in as to what in fact goes on in the interrogation rooms. A valuable source of information about present police practices, however, may be found in various police manuals and texts, which document procedures employed with success in the past and which recommend various other effective tactics. There's a footnote right here. You see what they're talking about? Um, the manual The manual was quoted in the text following are the most recent and representative of the text currently available. So on and so forth. Y'all can pause the video and read that, but I'm going to go ahead and get to the, uh, the types of tactics that they use because that's what they're about to talk about next. These texts are used by law enforcement agencies themselves as guides. It should be noted that these texts uh, professed, uh, professedly present, the most enlightened and effective means presently used to obtain statements through custodial interrogation. By considering these texts and other data, it is possible to describe procedures observed and noted around the country. The officers are told by the manuals that the principal psychological factor contributing to a successful interrogation is privacy being alone with the person under interrogation. The efficacy of this tactic has been explained as follows. Pay attention, y'all. If at all practicable, the interrogation should take place in the investigator's office or at least in a room of his own choice. The subject should be deprived of every psychological advantage. In his own home, he may feel confident, indignant, uh, indignant, or re, what is that? Recalcitrant, recalcitrant. I guess that's what it says. <clears throat> he is more, he is more keenly aware of his rights. I'm gonna read that. I'm gonna read this, this right here too. But let me go down and uh, finish reading right here. Uh, his rights, more reluctant to tell of his indiscretions of criminal uh, behavior within the walls of his home. Moreover, his family and other friends are nearby. Their presence lending is uh, their presence lending moral support. So they try to get you in a room by yourself. They don't want none of your family or your friends around you. So they so it's it's it's, it's very intimidating. In his own office, the investigator possesses all the advantages. The atmosphere suggests 
the, in, the invincibility of the forces of the law. All right, let's go up here. The methods described in, uh, in by you or read criminal interrogation and confessions are a revision and enlargement of material presented in three prior uh, editions of a, prede a predecessor text. Let's go. Uh, let's see. The author and the let me see. The authors and their associates are officers of the Chicago Police Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory, and have had extensive experience in writing lectures, in writing, lecturing, and speaking to law enforcement authorities over a twenty-year period. So this is science, y'all. This is science. They say that the techniques portrayed in their manuals reflect their experiences and are the most effective psychological stratagems to employ during interrogations. Similarly, summarily, uh, the techniques described in O'Hara, Fundamentals of Criminal Investigations, 1956, were gleaned from long service as observer Lecture as observer, lecturer in policing science in, in police science, and work as a federal criminal investigator. All these texts have had rather extensive use among law enforcement agencies and among students of police science, with the total sales and circulation of over forty-four thousand. So let's go back up here. I think we were down here on this page. So we were about right here. To highlight the isolation and unfamiliar and unfamiliar uh, surroundings, the manuals instruct the police to display an air of confidence in the suspect's guilt and from outward appearance to maintain only an interest in confirming certain details. The guilt of the suspect is to be posited as a fact the interrogator should direct his comments to, uh, towards the reasons why the subject committed the act. Notice that they keep calling him a subject. A subject. Like they sovereign and like they're not the subject. Anyway, um, the interrogator should direct his comments towards the reasons why the subject committed the act rather than court failure by asking the subject whether he did it. Like other men, perhaps the subject has had a bad family life and an unhappy, and an unhappy, unhappy childhood, <clears throat> had too much to drink, had a uh, unrequited desire for women. Uh, what is this? For women, the officers are instructed to minimize the moral seriousness of the offense. Uh, to cast blame on the victim or on the, or, or on society. These tactics are designed to put the subject in a psychological state where his story is but an elaboration of what the police purport to know already, that he is guilty. Explanations to the contrary are, are dismissed and discouraged. The text thus stress that the major qualities and uh, I'm sorry, that the major qualities an interrogator should possess are patience and perseverance. Perseverance. So let's go right here. There's a footnote. Let me see. The interrogator psychiatrist told the accused. Listen to how they plan. The, they, they plan these psychology games, y'all. We do sometimes things that are not right. But in a fit of temper or anger, we sometimes do things that we aren't really responsible for. And again, we know that morally you were just in anger. Morally, you are not to be condemned. They're trying to they're trying to use this reverse psychology on you to elicit um, a, a confession out of you. Basically, they're trying to make like they like they they're sorry. They sympathize with you and so on and so forth like that. This is a good case. I'm sorry I'm messing it up by the way I'm reading it, but bear with me, y'all. One writer describes the efficacy of these characteristics in this manner. In the preceding paragraphs, emphasis has been placed on kindness and stratagems. The investigator will, however, encounter many, many situations where the sheer weight of his personality will be the deciding factor where emotional appeals and tricks are employed to no avail, 
he must rely on an oppressive atmosphere of dogged persistence. He must interrogate steadily and without relent, leaving the subject no prospect of a uh, surcease. He must dominate his subject and overwhelm him with his inexorable will to uh, inexorable will to obtain the truth. Inexorable will to to obtain the truth. I'm sorry, y'all. He should interrogate for a spell of several hours, pausing only for the subject's necessities in acknowledgement of the need to avoid a charge of duress that can be technically substantiated. In a serious case, the interrogation may continue for days with the required intervals for food and sleep, but with no respite for the atmosphere of domination. It is possible in this way to induce the subject to talk without resorting to duress or coercion. The method should be used only when the, uh, the guilt of the suspect appears highly probable. The manual suggests that the suspect be offered legal excuses for his actions in order to obtain an initial admission of guilt. Pay attention, y'all. Where there is an where there is a suspected revenge killing, for example, the interrogator may say, "Joe, you probably didn't go out looking for this fellow with the purpose of shooting him. My guess is, however, that you expected something from from him, and that's why you carried a gun for your own protection." You knew him for what he was, no good. Then, when you met him, he probably started using foul, abusive language, and he gave some indication that he was about to pull a gun on you. And that's when you had to act to save your own life. That's about it, isn't it, Joe? <laughs> man, man, man. Are y'all getting this stuff, man? This is, this is, uh, this is a very good case, y'all. This is from 1966, y'all. 1966. Uh, having obtained the admission of shooting, the interrogator is advised to refer to circumstantial evidence which negates the self-defense explanation. Let me read that for y'all again because these are some tricky people, boy. Having then obtained the, the admission of shooting, meaning after they have after they've gotten you to admit that you shot um, that you shot the guy, the interrogator is advised to refer to circumstantial evidence which negates the self-defense explanation. So now uh, they're trying to um, use uh, circumstantial evidence, not direct evidence. They're trying to use circumstantial evidence to come up with some type of uh, so-called reasonable conclusion, which supports that this was not an act of self-defense. After they just used reverse psychology on you to get you to admit that you shot the guy in self-defense. <laughs> this is crazy, man. This should enable him to secure the entire story. One text notes that even if he fails to do so, the inconsistency between the subject's original denial of the shooting and his present admission of at least doing the shooting, pay attention, y'all, will serve to deprive him of a self-defense out at the time of trial. So it's going to make it seem like um, that he's lying. So that is, is, is some sort of they're going to use it as some sort of impeachment evidence. To attack his character, to uh, some sort of it's it's, it's an impeachment in uh, uh, tactic. That that's what it is. Crazy, y'all. When the techniques described above prove no availing, the texts recommend they be altered. I'm sorry, that be they be alternated. They be alternated with a show of some hostility. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> One ploy often used has been termed the friendly unfriendly or the Mutt and Jeff Act. Pay attention to this, y'all. <laughs> y'all might have seen this on movies before, because I have. In this technique, two agents are employed. Mutt, the relentless investigator who knows the subject is guilty and is not going to waste any time. He sent a dozen he sent a dozen men away for this same crime, I mean, for this crime, and he's going to send the subject away for the full term. 
Jeff, on the other hand, is obviously a kind hearted man. <laughs> he has he's he has a family himself. He has a brother who was involved in a little scrape like this. He disapproves of Mutt and his tactics and will arrange to get him off the case if the subject will cooperate. He can't hold Mutt off for very long. The subject will be wise to make a quick decision. The technique is applied by having both investigators present while Mutt acts out his role. Jeff may stand by quietly and demur at some of Mutt's tactics. When Jeff makes his plea for cooperation, Mutt is not present in the room. <laughs> Yo, boy, y'all, y'all getting this, man. The interrogators sometimes are instructed to induce a confection out of trickery. The techniques here is the technique here is quite effective in crimes which require identification or which run run in a series. In the identification situation, the interrogator may take a break in his questioning to place the subject among a group of men in a lineup. The witness or complainant, previously coached if necessary, studies the lineup and confidently points out the subject as the guilty party. Then the questioning resumes as though they were they were now I'm sorry as <laughs> then the questioning resumes as though there were now no doubt about the guilt of the subject. A variation on this technique is called the reverse lineup. The accused is placed in a lineup, but this time he is identified by several fictitious witnesses or victims who associated him with different offenses. It is expected that the subject will become desperate and confess to, to the offense under investigation in order to escape the false accusations. <laughs> The manuals also contain instructions for police on how to handle the individual who refuses to discuss the matter entirely or who asks for an attorney or relatives. The examiner is to concede him the right to remain silent. This usually has a very undermining effect. First of all, he is disappointed in his, expect in, in his expectation of an unfavorable reaction on part of the interrogator. Secondly, a, con, uh, a concession of this right to remain silent uh, silent uh, silent impresses yeah impresses the subject with the apparent fairness of his interrogator there's something else I wanted to read so I'm gonna go back up it's a footnote right I think it's 17 I'm gonna start right here a variant on the tech, I'm guessing that's going to say technique. Yeah, technique of creating hostility is one of the, in, the in, engendering fear, is one of engendering fear. This is perhaps the best described by the prosecuting attorney in, so this was a case, 1945. Uh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. But anyway, it says, why this talk about being undressed? Of course, they had a right to undress him to look for bullet scars and to keep the clothes off him. That was quite proper police procedure. Uh, that is some more psychological. Let me see. That is some more psychological, more psychology. Let him sit around with a blanket on him, humiliate him there for a while. Let him sit in a corner. Let him think he is going to get a, uh, a shell lacking or whatever they're talking about. I got to hire somebody to read this stuff, y'all. I'm sorry. But I just want y'all to pay attention now because they, they slick. So pay attention, y'all. Or y'all just going to read it for yourself. Y'all know what's like really funny. I'm going to get a little off topic. When I'm reading this stuff in my head, I read this stuff so much better as, as opposed to reading it out loud. Uh, but anyway, um, okay, here it is. Right, We're going to start back right here. After this psychological conditioning, however, the officer is told to point out the incriminating significance of the suspect's refusal to talk. Mm -hmm. Joe, you have a right to remain silent. Pay attention to this, y'all. This is so funny to me. That's your privilege, and I am the last person in the world who would try to take that from me, take that away from you. If that's the way you want to leave it, if that's the way you want to leave this, okay. But let me ask you this. Suppose you were in my shoes and I were in yours. 
and you called me in to ask me about this, and I told you, I don't want to answer any of your questions. You think I had something to hide, and you'd probably be right in thinking that. That's exactly what I'll have to think about you, and so will everybody else. So let's sit here and talk this whole thing over. <laughs> oh, boy. Few will persist. Few will persist in this initial refusal to talk, in, in their initial refusal to talk. It is said, if this monologue is employed correctly, uh, where are we at? Boy, I'm sorry. I got a headache, y'all. In the event that the subject wishes to speak to a relative or an attorney, the following advice is tendered. The interrogator should respond by suggesting that the subject first tell the truth to the interrogator himself rather than to get anyone else involved in the matter. <laughs> if the request is for an attorney, the interrogator may suggest that the subject save himself or his family the expense of any such professional service, particularly if he is innocent of the offense under investigation. The interrogator may also add, Joe, I'm only looking for the truth. And if you're telling the truth, that's it. You can handle this by yourself. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's see where we at right now. Um, I think that'll be... Was that it for this? Let me see. Cause there, I think there were about 22, 22 pages that I wanted to read. Well, no, I was going to stop at footnote 22. Okay. So there's going to be a series of these videos, y'all, uh, in regards to this case. Uh, I, I strongly advise y'all. Uh, I mean, if you can't handle, if you can't handle the, you know, the way that I'm, I'm butchering this case by reading it, I'm sorry. But just go and read the case for yourself. It's very interesting. Hopefully, this this gives you an idea of the tactics that they're using, and hopefully, this this uh, reestablishes. Um, your conviction, especially if you don't talk to the police, of why you should never talk to the police. Do not talk to the police. Even if even if you're innocent, do not talk to the police. Don't do that. They don't really care if you did it or not. That's just my own personal opinion. Um, that'll be the end of this video. The Supreme Litigant is out. Peace.